takes less muscle to smile than it does to cry. You know the difference. We all know the difference. So I hope you're smiling. Simpish smile. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. And <laughs> children, children. you and guide you today and you say your prayer that you ask all this in his holy name. Amen. Saints, may the Lord give you wonderful voices even more than usual. And it's a blessing to have you all do this. Thank you. Hmm? Yes, it is. It's excellent. The Lord be with you. Praise be to God. I just want to take a minute and say welcome back. I mentioned to someone this morning, maybe some of you have seen that scientific video of someone placing a mobile phone and turning it on and having it on top of an anthill. And all the ants stayed away and just went around in a circle. And I notice, being true Methodists, everyone's sitting in back of the church. So um, during the announcements, we're going to go through the status of the sanctuary and upstairs and the church in general. Coffee hour this morning will be up in this uh, library. Okay, so um, there's still some little work to be done, but uh, thanks to the trustees and, um, uh, of course, the chair Judson Drake um, were able to meet here this morning. For some announcements, last Sunday was Human Relations Day, one of the special offering Sundays held throughout the year 
by the United Methodist Churches. But in your bulletin, you'll see a new uh, pew card that explains the special day and purpose of your offerings, along with an envelope for you to use for your donations. So we will have a special offering along with our normal offering today. The Pregnancy Care Center brought us a box of baby bottles for us to participate in their annual baby bottle fundraiser. You remember we did that last year. Please consider picking up a bottle in the box in the narthex and place cash or coins or a check made out to the Pregnancy Care Center and return by Sunday, March 3rd. There's still time to complete the bulletin insert that outlines the two upcoming programs, the weekly Wesley Covenant Group and the six-week book study. What I'd like to be able to do is to give uh, this afternoon by way of email to Bobby uh, the dates for those events. Uh, what I need to call from what's given today is whether people would rather meet in the morning, afternoon, or evening. Um, and uh, I'm going to ask Bobby to be able to put that information in your weekly, rather extensive weekly recap. That'd be wonderful. Thank you. Copies of the December end of year financial reports are available in the narthex. All 2023 bills were paid. And in preparation for our 2023 church audit, all committee group treasurers are asked to please gather their records, bank statement records, etc., for 2023 and bring to the church office by Friday, February 2nd. Okay. And for those of you who know what the statistical reports are, oh, what a wonderful time of the year when we have to do this on val uh, for Valentine's Day. Um, for the conference and uh, it is our statistics that we do every single year and um, everyone has been so uh, gracious and uh, conscientious in getting that to Bobby in time and I know Bobby has already communicated those needs so thank you are there any announcements I have not covered okay thank you all right well <coughs> As God would have it, I came all with a presentation with like 120 photographs and some videos. Uh, and let me preface that by saying that on uh, a week ago Thursday, I was out walking the dog. And I was on one side of the porch, and Thurston was kind of agitated. There was a car parked right in front of where the elevator is under the portico. Uh, with its lights on for the longest time. And apparently, a good citizen was going by the church and heard the alarm and didn't see any cars. So I guess they promptly called the police. And I got a call from Judd when I went in, the parsonage saying, uh, could I come over and shut the alarm off? Uh, and I said, well, it sounds a little different for some reason. He says, well, it's either a fire or we're flooded. So the gentleman, had, who had, whoever called it in, had left by that time. The moment I opened the doors to the church, it sounded like I was in the Congo in rain and waterfalls. Now, Judd is with us this morning. Hi, Judd. Thank you. Within 15 minutes, Judd was on the phone calling our insurance agent, or the insurance company, Fred C. Church. He's also called other, other services, some that we've used before, I, I suppose, and people that uh, uh, we've known and, the, and are friends of the church, to come, and he called the trustees. And, um, yeah. Um, so we did due diligence in contacting uh, the people in the conference. Uh, sometime this week, we're supposed to be seeing the representative from the insurance company. And, you know, you think of it. Visually, if you look for, for problems, you're going to find problems. But, you know, um, a lot of the visual stuff, a lot of the stuff beneath it, the real serious stuff, has been taken care of by the time someone shows. So the photographs are extremely important. But today, we don't even have a projector. So we're looking at... at uh, 
what has to happen to, to get that projector fixed or online again. Okay? So next week, <laughs> we'll have some good photographs. So I just wanted to let you know. And Judd, if I may explain what happened, uh, is, you know, this church is a phenomenal thing just on its own architecturally. Did you know that the attic is larger than this sanctuary? And it has over 200 sprinkler heads just upstairs. And it was designed to be the same temperature as outside. And there are sprinkler heads very near the roof, the inside of the roof, so that when, if there, God forbid, should be a fire, water comes up on the flames, etc. Otherwise, it would be missing that. No one expected that in this time of year we would have no snow. And you remember we've gone to 50 degrees, 40 degrees, 13, 10, and then back up again. That's exactly what's happened during the week that this happened. Condensation had formed um, on some of those pipes, specifically the sprinkler heads. And uh, one particular sprinkler head froze and broke. Very difficult to try to um, keep track of, of uh, that even project that that would happen. The people who came to help, uh, well, to do the attic, the insulation, which is paper-based, absorbed all the water, and they removed over three tons of ice and insulation from the attic. So the fear was that this ceiling would collapse. And if we could not have the sprinklers working, by, technically by law, we're not supposed to be meeting as a group uh, for fear of fire, etc. So, um, okay, we have no choice but to re-insulate the attic. The suggestion from the experts is that we must also insulate the, uh, the, the inside of the roof of this attic with uh, foam insulation to make sure that we're covered whatever the weather decides to do. Now, I don't know about you, but I can't even, no matter what connections you or I have, we're never going to know, other than the Farmer's Almanac, what is expected for weather. And we're expected now for more frigid weather to come. Bear in mind, there's hardly any insulation now up in our attic. So people have asked already, well, I thought this was supposed to be taken care of the very first time we had that flood, or the second time we had the flood. And I'm not speaking for the trustees, but I'll speak for um, myself and what I'm hearing. And that is that you cannot 100% plan for the future. What you can do is say, this is what we need to do to be safe. We can realign the pipes. We could do whatever we need to do. But can you plan for every single contingency? No. No one expected this to happen. Judd, that morning, if not early afternoon, check that all out before this happened and everything was fine. So if it wasn't for the fact that the trustees, after this last time, did some real good work with insulation, um, real good work with a compressor, etc., they put things into place that made at least this time manageable. Otherwise, despite the damage that we've, we have, as you can see, we're worshiping together. Praise be to God. All right. The, all right. So I've sort of been elected to bring to your attention that you see our stewardship program is late, of course, this year. But um, the stewardship committee met uh, last Friday. And um, we will have uh, something that we'd be able to communicate with you about for stewardship. Um, that'll also be a program that'll go throughout the year. Can I make that announcement on behalf of trustees? OK. We are going to be starting a fund that we're calling the Emergency um, uh, Sprinkler Fund. $180,000. Well, I didn't hear anyone gasp. And I was going to call this presentation, especially with the photographs, Don't Shoot the Messenger. Um, it's not like 
we can have a church charge conference and say, well, do we want to do this thing or not? We would not be meeting here if we did that. And we're still, as I understand, winter's just started. So, okay. Um, let me see. So there'll be more details on that uh, with everyone. Uh, as soon as we talk to Rick McKinley, who I'm waiting to hear from relative to this, whether we have to have a church charge conference to talk about what, what the future is. Uh, did you realize, does anyone know how hot this sanctuary becomes in the summertime? 139 degrees. It's because of these windows. Now, we're not saying take the windows out. What we are saying is that there's a way to use the ambient heat from the sanctuary to help heat the attic. And that combination with the insulation would mean that nothing heat-related should happen to those sprinklers again. Okay? So this is a work in progress. Uh, also, part of that keeping a, a temperature that's somewhat consistent is the addition of an... Um, what do you call it, an air carrier or air handler? Air handler. Downstairs in the fellowship hall, we have an air handler that's a HEPA filter. And it recycles the air completely several times an hour, I believe. So in the height, in, the light, in light of what's happening with COVID, and what, in light of what's happening with COVID, we'll always be here in some way, shape, or form. Uh, and to help any concerns about having funerals where a lot of people gather or celebrations where a lot of people gather. Uh, part of the having an, an, uh, an air handler added to that system upstairs will allow us to have a free f exchange of fresh air in this sanctuary. Right now, the only fresh air we get is if we were to open up the doors. The only doors that we're able to open for fresh air are those two that are out front. Okay, so Judd, anything I have to add right now is the next step? No? I'm doing good, thank you. Thank you. But God goes with us, and if we openly communicate with one another and with trustees uh, and get to a point, we, we need to be transparent so you know what's going on, what all that costs, etc. We've looked at uh, church funding, uh, the account, some of the accounts that the church has, and that enters into the equation. So please search your hearts, and if you need to find out more information, Judd is with us today. Um, but we're starting that campaign. Uh, when will they begin the work up in the attic, Judd? So the hope is when we see the insurance person this week and able to show him those photographs in person as well and actually walk around the facility, I would expect that there would be a communication to the entire church from the trustees explaining the status, where we are, and what to expect from that. Okay? So let's, let, let's, let's not let money be what's fueling our thoughts and prayers, but instead that we're able to continue to gather uh, and into the history being a viable church and beautiful facility. Okay, thank you. So 
if there, does anyone have anything to say, anything they need to add? Okay, choir, you could sing it. No? Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let's stand for our call to worship. God is our refuge and our strength. The church stand. Amen. God is the rock of our salvation. Let the church say amen. God is our certain hope in times of trial. Let the church say amen. Our God is an awesome God. Let the church say amen. Oh, now why don't you do the... Then why don't you do the, the uh, opening prayer? Hmm? <laughs> Thank you. Holy God, as we begin the worship service, let us be mindful that many in our world today would rather proclaim death to our enemies than see them forgiven and redeemed. Forgive our hardness of heart, O oh God, and our reluctance to see your divine image in those around us, especially those who hate and despise us. Teach us to love our enemies, that our lives may proclaim your truth, that truth is stronger than love, and mercy is greater than vengeance. We ask this in the name of the Prince of Peace. Amen. Please join us in the opening hymn for the healing of nations in the United Methodist Hymnal number 428. Thank you. 
Okay. Please be seated. There's no mystery box today. Now I was thinking, what do I do in place of a mystery box? Well, I just wanted to show you guys something. This is my collection of harmonicas. Okay. And now this is my harmonica, and it's a marine band harmonica. This is a relatively new harmonica, and it's got 20, 20 openings on it. So it's about a third larger than regular ones. This is my dad's harmonica. And he used to sit outside on the porch, and he used to just play, you know, give me land, lots of land with the starry scars above. Don't fence me in. So that's the first one he taught me. This is one that I wanted to briefly talk to you about. Have you ever heard of Honer harmonicas? Honer, H-O, yep, a Honer harmonica, let me see, H-O-H-N-E-R. Well, they're in Germany. And the thing is, they're a world famous harmonica company. And this harmonica is a chromatic harmonica that can change notes. The thing is that's special about this is that you see, the Nazis, right before the war, approached Honer Harmonica and they said, listen, your symbol are hands holding a star. And that star is the David star. It's not. But you take that off your harmonicas or we'll close you down. Hmm. Well, I found that out after I bought the harmonica. See, saints, Hona harmonica represents the support of people's gifts in music. Now granted, not the black sheep, but the low on the totem pole for religious music or, or sacred music is the harmonica. And if any of you follow the Gaither Gospel Group, they've got some shows wherever, and there's someone who actually plays classical music on an harmonica. Okay? Now, I wanted to say that because this has special significance. Because they took the star off their harmonica because of the Nazis' request to do so, to save the company. Okay? So this is the last harmonica that Honer had the star. Okay, so, and I'm, I'm just gonna play what this sounds like. wrong notes, but the heart was there. Today, though it was online last week, we've got the choir singing a piece they were going to sing last week in person, and we've got our own Aurora going to be playing the flute. She's, and I'll tell you, I was fluctuating when I was using the word flutist. It should be flautist, right? Looking, so we've talked about the things people have saved, the pe things people brought in to be able to say, this is, reminds me of the love of God. Music. Music is just a wonderful way to bring God to life for people who enjoy music, especially those who are the elderly who are in our nursing homes or whatever. There are so many nursing homes with, with musical uh, ministry, technically, for their, for their patients where they know every single piece of 
music that that person liked in their youth. It's just amazing. So whenever you have an opportunity and you feel a hankering to join the choir, you know you can see Margaret if you'd like to be in the choir, okay? And we'll pick a Sunday when we'll do something together, okay? A flute and a harmonica. I wonder how that will work. All right. God bless. Thank you. Who wants it for next week? Would anyone like the music box for next week? See? Magic. Uh, not magic. Thank you. Mystery. Mystery. Would anyone like the mystery box for next week? All right. I'll give it to you after the service, okay? Okay? Deb? So I present Aurora Barnum was playing for us. Thank you. Could you all rise for the Psalter? Psalm 62, 5 through 12. You'll find it in the United Methodist Hymnal, 787. For God alone, my soul waits in silence. My hope is from God, 
who alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress, I shall not be shaken. On God rests my deliverance and my honor. My mighty rock, my refuge is God. Trust in God at all times, O people. Pour out your heart before God, who is a refuge for us. Those of low estate are but a breath. Those of high estate are a delusion. In the balances, they go up. They are together lighter than a breath. In confidence in extortion, set no vain hopes on robbery. If riches increase, set not your heart on them. Once God has spoken, twice have I heard this. Power belongs to God. And to you, O Lord, belong steadfast love, for you repay all according to their work. <clears throat> Please be seated. The reading this morning is from the Old Testament, Jonah 3, verse 1 to 5, 9 to 10, chapter 4, 1 through 11. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time, saying, get up, go to Nineveh, that great city, and proclaim to it the message that I tell you. So Jonah set out and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly large city, a three days walk across. And Jonah began to go into the city, going a day's walk. And he cried out, 40 days more and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And the people of Nineveh believed God. They proclaimed a fast, and everyone, great and small, put on sackcloth. Who knows? God may relent and change his mind. He may turn from his fiercer anger so that we do not perish. And when God saw what they did, how they turned from their evil ways, God changed his mind about the calamity that he had said he would bring upon them, and he did not do it. But this was a very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, is this not what I said while I was still in your country? This is why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning, for I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishment. And now, Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. And the Lord said, is it right for you to be angry? Then Jonah went out of the city and sat down east of the city and made a booth for himself there. He sat under it in the shade, waiting to see what beco would become of the city. The Lord God appointed a bush and made it come up over Jonah to give shade over his head, to save him from his discomfort. So Jonah was very happy about the bush. But when dawn came up the next day, God appointed a worm that attacked the bush so that it withered. And when the sun rose, God prepared a <coughs> sultry east wind, and the sun beat down on the head of Jonah so that he was faint and asked that he might die. He said, it is better for me to die than to live. But God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the bush? And he said, yes, angry enough to die. And then the Lord said, you are concerned about the bush for which you did not labor, in which you did not grow. It came into being in a night and perished in a night. And should I not be concerned about Nineveh, that great city in which there are more than 120,000 persons who do not know their right hand from their left, and also many animals? This ends the reading. Praise be to God. <clears throat>
churches where <clears throat> it was set up so the choir would sing earlier in the service and they'd all come down. Rows were left for the choir so the pastor never had his back to the choir. Hmm. Huh? Well, we'll talk, we'll talk about that. Saints, I'm serious that if you have uh, a gift and you play an instrument or you have a relative that plays an instrument, um, have them come and, and, and talk to Margaret or myself or someone else who's in the choir. I mean, uh, thank you for sharing your gift with us. Thank you for sharing your gifts with us. It was, that was wonderful. Wonderful. Well, good morning, saints. Good morning. Can you hear me all right? I think so. Excellent. Okay. So let me ask you, have you ever been angry with God? Hmm? Have you ever been angry with God in a way because he handled, the way he handled some things in your life? You would have done it otherwise, another way. I mean, sometimes we get just plain old angry with God. But don't share with our Lord when we pray. After all, we're only human. And though we're made in God's image, we're still limited human beings who have a proclivity for sin. But who have an advocate in Jesus Christ through whom we have eternal life. Wow. Knowing that we can do anything through Christ who strengthens us. And that's Philippians 413. Remember, saints, we are precious treasure in fragile jars of clay. Some of us with thinner clay than others. But that just means that the reason why we have a weakness inherent in us is so we fully rely on God. When, has anyone, have you ever been able to do something in your life or the Lord touched your life and people who may be outside your family or outside your personal realm of influence, say, you know, wonder, wow, I wouldn't have been able to survive that. How do you find the strength? You know, what I've heard before from people in different uh, cultures, perhaps, who come to this country and, and they make a life and their children go to church, is some people ask, of a church like the Methodist Church is a good example. Why do you go to church on a Sunday morning when you could do so many other things? Why do you go and not only put up with, put up with church for an hour, sometimes an hour and a half, sometimes two hours, and then you go spend another couple of hours in fellowship and coffee cake? Why do you go to church? And see, that's something that a lot of people 
especially those who are active in our churches, not cannot do, it seems they won't do. They won't write down why is it that they go to church. I mean, how many times have people, I wish I had a nickel for every time someone has said to me, I love it here. It's a family here. I come to be with my friends and family in this place, in this space. That's a precious thing. But think of all those people who are outside these doors that have no such place. So the younger people who are coming up, they're wondering, oh, well, the church, forget the denomination, the church must be a special club. I mean, for some reason, all these people park their cars and they come in and they lock the doors and you maybe hear music being played. But gee, no one invited me in. It's got to be a private thing. What are they discussing? Hmm. The message today is not just about the celebration of a people repenting in Nineveh and turning back towards God. It's a great and wonderful thing. You've, isn't it wonderful to see someone led by the Spirit do the work of God? It's also about our attitude upon seeing the Lord make a way out of no way for people with whom you've had issues. It's about letting God be God and striving to support those who got it straight because of God, who seem now to be forgiven by, empowered by, given a chance by God. You know, that's one of the difficult things we have to deal with, especially in the church is we may be trying to, to, to wrestle with how God is calling us in our lives. And we may be praying for that deliverance, praying for God to touch us and to help us know what we need to do. And then with all that stress and strain, somebody stands up and has a joy and talks about that they, that they finally came to Christ and that they're they find themselves no longer addicted, no longer enchanted with alcohol. Or someone stands up and speaks, and you're envious because you wanted the Lord to bless you that way. Hmm. Truth be told, Almighty God is not going to call you on your cell phone tomorrow. I'll Take bets if anybody wants to, but we're not, Methodists don't bet. And tell you his plans for the day. He's not going to ask you, uh, here's what I want to do. Uh, do I have your blessing? He's not going to do that. So what do you do? If you don't know the will of God, you need to communicate with God. You need to know what is of and what is not of God. The God I know wouldn't do this. The Christ that loves me would not do this. Hmm. Case in point, you all remember Jonah? He tried to run away from God. God asked him to go to Nineveh and tell them they had made God angry and they must change their ways and repent or be destroyed. But Jonah ran away from God to Tarshish. Have you ever ran away what you know God wanted you to do? Do you have people that just stick in your craw and you get upset with yourself because you know you should forgive that person. You know you should give that person slack. But you know, that's not an easy thing for we human beings to do. God brought a storm on the boat that Noah, that Noah, that uh, uh, Jonah was on. The shipmates who knew that Jonah was running from God prayed to the Lord not to harm them, and Jonah himself suggested that they throw him into the sea. Stubborn Jonah was swallowed up by a whale that the Lord brought, and Jonah finally prayed to God, and the whale vomited him out on dry land on the shore, Bible says, after three days and three nights. So has the Lord ever put you through trials and tribulations 
in which you've learned a lesson. It's all connected with prayer. This story just shows how tenacious our God is. Brothers and sisters, who are you when God tugs at your heart or shirt sleeves to do something? Needing you to listen more intently on what you need to do. Who can you most relate to in this story? Are you Jonah, who just refuses to talk to God and tries to go uh, his own way to escape having to deal with that? Or are you like the men in the boat, praying to God that Jonah, who's running away from God, that they won't punish them? Let him go, punish him, but don't involve me. Or are you the Jonah who finally gets it? The Jonah who prays to God in thankfulness, willing finally to do what God wants him to do. But that's only the tip of the iceberg. Are you the one to ignore God's talking to you? Do you refuse to see or hear or feel the signs that you need to address? Are you open enough with the Holy Spirit to have even the words you pick up in the newspaper mean something spiritual to you? With the Holy Spirit, God has said how many, the Lord has said how many times in Scripture that the Spirit will open your eyes and your ears and your heart to take something that may be normal to other people, but it has spiritual significance from God. In the scripture we just heard read, God calls Jonah a second time and tells him to go to Nineveh, going as a prophet to proclaim a message from God. That's the difference between a disciple who may be filtering things down that's said in scripture and presented but if God touches them and says, this is my word, go and give it to these people, that is a prophet and it's a gift. Jonah made it only one third on his huge, in this huge city, a three day walk from one end to the other, and proclaimed that Nineveh will be destroyed in 40 days. In short, everyone believed in God's message, repented, fasted, even the king put on sackcloth, which is a Hebrew tradition when a member of the family dies in a Jewish family, they put on sackcloth and sit figuratively in ashes, a sign of mourning. But they all praised God and repented. God was so moved by this that he did not destroy Nineveh. Now this dynamic of a people hearing God, turning back to God, and repenting of their sins is something the Lord asks us continually, even to today. But it's, that's not, as I said, the whole picture. It's a scenario not everyone, even in today's world, is happy with. And it has to do with respect, attitude, and perspective. Some people today think they know the whole story and cannot let God be God. They have to analyze what the Lord has done and judge those who share uh, our domain our circle of influence, and wondering if certain people deserve the blessings they've been given by God. Have you ever doubted how God has taken a people or a person and blessed them and said, gee, that doesn't sound right? You know, I was on vacation one year when I was in Brockton, Massachusetts, uh, Pentecost United Methodist, and I happened to meet the current pastor of another Methodist church in that city. So after our checking in with each other, this pastor shared with me that one of my church members, Deb, one of my liturgists, had come to that pastor's church one Sunday while I was away. Now that was the Sunday immediately following the death of President Gerald Ford, and immediately follows the execution of Saddam Hussein. Do you remember that? I recounted how I've never had my phone ring off the hook like it did that Sunday afternoon. I'm literally hours. 
During prayer time, I spoke about each of them, Ford and Hussein, each being born children of God in God's image, each imbued with the potential to do wonderful things. I had told my congregation that we should pray for both of these children of God, that both Gerald Ford and Saddam Hussein will stand in the presence of God and Christ to make an account of their lives. Do you all believe that? Do you believe that someday, when the Lord calls us home, we will stand before the presence of Christ and have an accounting of our lives? That has to account for something in your life on what you do and how you do it. Hmm. Well, I told them both Gerald Ford and Saddam Hussein will each stand in the presence of God and Christ to make an account of their lives. We know which direction each one of them took. We pray for them both being in God's hands. I've never had so many negative calls on the phone or so many people verbally accost me while I stood at the door shaking hands after the benediction. The pastor I was talking to on the train said that Deb, one of my parishioners, who was present on that fateful Sunday, went uh, to her, uh, yeah, she went back to a church on the next Sunday. Deb was there at this pastor's church. And the pastor's message she gave that day was about forgiveness and repentance. The pastor actually asked the congregation if Sudan, Hussein, was here today, crying intently, deeply sobbing, and fell upon his knees praying for forgiveness, and then laid prostrate at the altar with a repentant heart, asking and sobbing God for forgiveness from us and from God. What would you say? Well, she was sitting there. Deb gets up in the middle of the aisle and says, I'd say, sit back down. That was the consensus of the churches, both of those churches, that day. So here's Jonah sent by God to give God's message, and the people repented, and God forgave them and decided not to destroy them. But Jonah was absolutely furious. He lost his temper when the city didn't blow up. Have you ever been angry with God for doing something you do not agree with, as I asked? Did you ever pray about it? Is that still taking up valuable space in your soul? Because the Lord will take care of it. It's not your job to judge or approve what the Lord has decided to do. Well, Jonah yelled at God, God, I knew it. When I was back home, I knew this was going to happen. That's why I ran off to Tarshish in the first place. I knew you were sheer grace and mercy, not easily angered, rich in love and ready at the drop of a hat to turn your plans of punishment into a program of forgiveness. So God, if you won't kill them, kill me. I'm better off dead. Kill me. Shoot me now. It's like a teenager having a tantrum, isn't it? God said, what do you have to be angry about? But Jonah just left. He went out to the city to the east and sat down sulking in the hot sun outside the city, waiting for God to do something. Jonah put together a makeshift shelter of leafy branches and sat there in the shade to see what would happen to the city, but there was no explosion, no wailing of the people, no fire. And I remind you, saints, of the building across the street. From 4 o'clock in the morning on, devastated by fire. And I've heard some people say, not just in some people in this congregation, and in other congregations say, good, I'm glad it's destroyed. Because then there won't be that happening there anymore. Well, God has a sense of humor. So now the garage that should have been exploded with it, that little garage has about 15 people living in it. So we should be praying 
not, not happy for the demise of someone's home or shelter. It is a shelter nonetheless. And if there are things that are happening that are illegal, like drugs, etc., I'm praying that there's people there who are not tempted to be on drugs. But nonetheless, each and every one in there is a child of God. Child of God. So we can pray that the Lord empowers them to do something, that, the, that there's programs put in place that can help. And we are always, our radar in the church is always up to see what we can do for those who are less fortunate than ourselves. We see God arranged for a broadleaf tree to spring up. It grew over Jonah to cool him off and get him out of his angry sulking. But Jonah was pleased and enjoyed the shade. For him, life was looking up. But when God sent a worm that evening, by dawn of the next day, the worm had bored into the tra- shade tree and it withered away. The sun had come up and God decided to send a hot, blistering wind from the east. The sun beat down on Jonah's head and he started to faint. And he prayed to die. I'm better off dead, he prayed. Then God said to Jonah, what right do you have to get angry about the shade tree? You know, this is something that many of us saints do. Jonah said, what right do I have to get angry? Plenty of right. It made me angry enough to die. Saints, many times we get angry about things that we have no control over. You ever done that? I have. Gifts of God we take for granted. We miss the fact that God is God and can bless whomever and whenever God chooses. We forget that every one of God's children deserves to be blessed and forgiven, especially if their hearts are genuinely repentant. If not, if someone did wrong and worked basically against God, God will deal with that, not you, saints. You deserve to be blessed and steeped in the Spirit of God. Don't deprive someone else of a blessing because you bear a grudge or don't believe they should get one or that they're not worthy. I know, brothers and sisters, there's so much violence, war, conflict, and senseless killing in the world, and you can't turn on any of your devices, including cable television. Remember cable? Okay where you're not hearing about the violence and war and things like this. He said, she said, and all that violence. But it's not your job to get angry in ways that leaves Christ out of it. It's our job, saints, as believers, to pray for the world, pray for each other, pray for ourselves, and pray against evil and injustice wherever we find it. That is why John Wesley said the world is his parish. We can't, saints, do the work of God in the world in the will of God for us, but the Holy Spirit has to be our motivator and power giver, not the media. Let God be God. You know, there's a myriad of research papers online about what the pandemic has done to people's temperaments. Have you read any? Huh. Maybe some of this sounds familiar. Now more than ever, people can be quick to judge, slow to forgive, tempers are shorter, more argumentative, less hopeful, and sometimes downright nasty. We reason together less, openly communicate less. Often, times of late, people can shoot first and ask questions later, as that saying goes. And I'm not saying saints, that you're doing this in this church. I'm saying you're only human. We need to rely and communicate with God. In the fast pace of our lives, we now interact with others. We need to see God in our lives and how God is working in our midst. We've got to acknowledge that the Lord's grace is up to God to give. And we've all had circumstances where the Lord graces us, And we say, oh, we're in the middle of something, and we receive God's grace. And we respond to that, but the next thing we know, it's gone. The Lord giveth, and the Lord taketh away. It's a learning experience, saints. So here's what...
God says in response to Jonah. God said, what's this? How is it that you can change your feelings from pleasure to anger overnight about a mere shade tree that you did nothing to get? You neither planted nor watered it. It grew up one night and died the next night. So why can't I likewise change what I feel about Nineveh from anger to pleasure? Why can't I, almighty God, offer forgiveness instead of revenge? Hmm. The big city of more than 120,000 childlike people, and this is key, who don't yet know right from wrong, who do not yet know right from wrong, to say nothing of the innocent animals. So let me ask you, saints, I'll close with this. If one of the reasons why God did not destroy Nineveh is because they repented of their sins, they understood that they did wrong, but God considers them children that do not know the difference between right and wrong, who are they going to get that from? You. They're going to get it from the Spirit talking to you, you knowing who God is, reacting to God in your life. That's who they're going to learn it from. It's in the ministries that the church has. It's in all the outreach that the church does. It's even as simple as the, the communion group that goes out to see people, and communion being as personal as it is. How, how healing is that for the people receiving communion? Hmm. Let's pray. Lord, we pray for those around us who seem to be without a rudder and in harm's way. Let's ask for blessings for those in need and in great distress that they might be given God's grace and that we may be supportive and prayerful and a further blessing for them. Let us, Lord, cut them slack and be able to concentrate on the ways that we can help them learn and grow and know the difference between right and wrong not destruction, and lead us, Lord, in the way we should go together with God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit. We ask all this in his holy, precious name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat>
Oh, Heavenly Father, please accept this humble offering. We know, Lord, that everything we have, we have because of your unbounded love for us. Each dollar an opportunity to be in service to you, Lord. But money is not the only impetus for us to give. Lord, help us not to run from your call in our lives. Give us the power of your Holy Spirit to guide us on how we use our resources, to guide us on considering our church and each other as valuable resources for you, Lord. Bless this offering and place it in the hands of those who can make a real difference in this community, in this church, and through our denomination, the world. Lord, we ask all this in your holy, precious name. Amen. Please be seated. We now come to the part of the service where we respond with prayers, praise and thanksgiving. In a roar, I'm going to ask you if anyone does raise their hand to raise someone else additionally, you'd bring a mic over to them. Thank you. Thank you. Lord, we ask your blessings upon these people. Make a way out of no way for them. Bring people to them to help uh, minister to them, to visit with them, to share Christ's love with them. Anna Roberts, Sylvia Akeley, Leland Frost, Ralph Ferguson, Gwen Ellenwood, Richard Card, Ivan Shaw, Don DeMerchant, Dee Dee Nichols, Debbie and Lou Sharp, Robert Locke, Linda Sear, family of Tom Todd, Ruth Weeks' cousin who passed away January 10th. Mm, praise be to God. God bless him. James Stewart, family of Roland Cowett, passed away Friday, January 12th. Mm. Anyone else we need to be praying for today? Well, I'd like to pray for, add to these prayers, the people uh, who are struggling in this cold weather, the people who may not have the resources. We pray that the Lord connect them to the proper resources and that the Holy Spirit does continue to engage us and help us know through the Holy Spirit what is needed to help them. Lord, be with these people. Be with every doctor and, and nurse, every attendant, the people who are hospitalized, people who are shut-ins. Also, Lord, we ask blessings for Anna, who's in a new facility, and she is getting used to that life where she's she would certainly welcome someone to go visit her and just to spend some time with her. And um, Mary, you said you've spoken to her, have you? Not yet, all right. To Leland, okay, yes. I spoke to her last week. She's number 109, the little one right next door. 109, 109 in Presque Isle, thank you. Okay. Lord, we now ask that you help us pray the prayer that you taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Saints, let us stand up for our closing hymn, Softly and Tenderly, Jesus is Calling, verses 1, 2, and 4, hymn, United Methodist Hymnal 348.
calling, but if you're talking too much, you're not going to be able to hear what God is saying. And if you react too much, you're not going to be able to feel how the Holy Spirit is asking you to feel. If you're so involved with what's happening with you, and you are sure that you've got it, that's a good sign that you need to be still and be in touch with God. So, will you, and I used to tell this to youth groups, will you, when someone says something on television, or you see something, uh, for, for Karen it used to be the, the little puppies you see on TV that are cold and freezing and things like this, and it took her mind off of a lot of other things, but she, like most of us, just love animals. Hmm? When you hear something that rubs you the wrong way, don't react. Pray for them. When you see someone acting badly in this world, rather than saying, do I agree with what he or she says or not, instead, stop what you're doing and say, help me, Lord Jesus. Help them, Lord Jesus. Call upon God and Christ to help them with the situation. Will you? Because if you remove yourself from it and go to God instead, you'll get used to going to God first. And God will temper what it is you feel and what you say, for you're holding everything under the light of Jesus Christ. May our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ bless you and keep you. May he make his countenance to shine upon you and give you his grace, his peace, and his understanding of your normal each and every day life. We ask all this in his holy precious word and his holy precious name. Amen. Go now in peace. Thank you. Coffee hour is up here. Saint. Yeah, because there's been so many deaths from this congregation and no support kind of way.